Right near the end of the Doctrine and Covenants are Official Declaration 1 and Official Declaration 2. Then before we're done, we're going to make a little stop in the Articles of Faith and the Pearl of Great Price. Now, these aren't revelations themselves. They're declarations that acknowledge that the President of the Church had received a revelation. But they are important to read and understand so that you know the proper context. So let's start with Official Declaration 1, which functionally ended the practice of plural marriage within the Church. All throughout the 19th century, there were people that did not like that the Latter-day Saints practiced plural marriage. The federal government of the United States initiated several laws starting in 1862 and continuing on through the following decades that gradually ratcheted up the pressure on the members and leaders of the church to practice plural marriage. Now, most of the saints didn't practice plural marriage, but all the saints believed that plural marriage was a revelation from God and that they had a right to practice it under the United States Constitution. So they went back and forth in fighting this and saying that they believed they were commanded by God to practice it. At a certain point, though, God allows people, if it becomes too difficult to keep a commandment, he can give a revelation and change or alter it. So by 1887, the Edmunds-Tucker Act had been passed, and the Edmunds-Tucker Act did a number of things like disincorporate the church, confiscate all church property worth over $50,000, and forbid Latter-day Saints from even voting unless they took an oath saying that they were opposed to plural marriage. It's difficult to imagine what it must have been like for the saints to feel like their rights were trampled, and a lot of them started to wonder what the way forward was if they could continue resisting the federal government like they had been. The leader of the church at this time was Wilford Woodruff, who was overwhelmed by these forces that had been arrayed against the church. President Woodruff kept a pretty good detailed journal, and on December 31st, 1889, he wrote the following. Thus ends the year 1889, and the word of the prophet Joseph Smith is beginning to be fulfilled that the whole nation would turn against Zion and make war upon the saints. The nation has never been filled so full of lies against the saints as today. It was in these really difficult conditions that President Woodruff prayed sincerely to know if the church should continue to practice plural marriage. One of the things that President Woodruff mentioned was that the Lord showed him that if the saints continued to practice plural marriage, the temples would go out of their hands and the work for the dead would cease. With that in mind, President Woodruff went ahead and issued Official Declaration 1, also known as the Manifesto. Now, one of the things you'll notice as you read Official Declaration 1 is how gentle the language is. This was a principle that the saints had sacrificed and defended for 50 years, and President Woodruff realized how difficult what he was asking them to do was. In the Declaration, he basically asked the saints to obey the laws of the land, which had been upheld by the highest courts, and asked the saints to be law-abiding citizens. Official Declaration 1 reads, Inasmuch as laws have been enacted by Congress forbidding plural marriages, which laws have been pronounced constitutional by the court of last resort, I hereby declare my intention to submit to those laws and to use my influence with the members of the church over which I preside to have them do likewise. Now, this didn't end plural marriage altogether, just the practice of new plural marriages allowing it to gradually be phased out. But it does also just ask the saints to obey the law. So some saints at this time had questions about what if they were living in a country where plural marriage wasn't illegal? What if they were somewhere like Mexico or Canada where it was still legal to practice plural marriage? The saints in those areas had questions about whether or not they should continue practicing it. And the saints in the United States had questions about what happened to those that are already entered into plural marriage. First things first, President Woodruff addressed those who were already practicing plural marriage. He gave a speech shortly after the manifesto was given where he said, This manifesto only refers to future marriages and does not affect past conditions. I did not, I could not, and I would not promise that you would desert your wives and children. This you cannot do in honor. When it came to the people outside the United States, President Woodruff tried to be as gentle as possible. But about 15 years after the first manifesto was given, a second manifesto was given that basically declared that plural marriage wasn't allowed anywhere in the church, regardless of whether it was legal or not in the country where you're at, and that a person would be cut off from the church if they refused to submit to those principles. That leads us to the policy that still exists in the church today. President Gordon B. Hinckley taught, if any of our members are found to be practicing plural marriage, they are excommunicated. 
the most serious penalty the church can impose. Not only are those so involved in direct violation of the civil law, they're in violation of the law of the church. And President Hinckley also mentioned that even if you were living in a country where plural marriage was legal, we still don't allow a person to enter into plural marriage. Within a generation, plural marriage ended, and we honor those who defended the principle and those who lived it according to the commandments of God. But today we've got to remember that we're forbidden from practicing plural marriage, that we do believe eternal marriage is still an important principle, teaching of our religion. Now, Official Declaration 2 deals with another really difficult question, which is the question of race and the priesthood. Early on in the church, the priesthood was given to almost everybody. In fact, as the introduction mentions, Joseph Smith was present in the church when at least three people of African descent were ordained to the priesthood. The Book of Mormon also talks about every single person, regardless of their racial background, being invited to come unto Christ. The Book of Mormon says, He inviteth them all to come unto him and partake of his goodness, and he denieth none that come unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and female. With that in mind, it might seem strange that in 1852, the leaders of the church issued a declaration that they would no longer ordain people of African descent to the priesthood or allow them to receive the blessings of the temple. President Brigham Young announced the policy, but when he announced the policy, he directly indicated that it was a temporary policy. He taught that all black church members would eventually have all the privileges and more enjoyed by other members of the church. For several generations, this was the policy of the church and continued onward until it became a major question in the latter part of the 20th century. By the latter part of the 20th century, people around the globe of a number of different races had heard of the church and expressed a desire to join. For instance, maybe you see this angel Moroni, which is clearly modeled after the picture of the angel Moroni that was on the copy of the Book of Mormon at the time. This angel Moroni was sculpted by a congregation of people in Ghana who wanted to join the church but were of black African descent. These people started to contact church headquarters, and because of that, questions about the priesthood policy started to come to the forefront. Now, as mentioned, starting with Brigham Young, almost every president of the church had said that the policy would eventually be ended. For instance, Wilford Woodruff said, the day will come when all that race will be redeemed and possess all the blessings. President David O. McKay taught, sometime in God's eternal plan, the blacks will be given the right to hold the priesthood. And President Harold B. Lee taught, the blacks will achieve full status, we're just waiting for that time. But the person that actually received the revelation ending the priesthood policy was Spencer W. Kimball. Spencer W. Kimball was well prepared for this. He had spent a lot of his life working with and ministering people of different races. He grew up in Arizona and worked particularly closely with the Native Americans that lived in and around that area. President Kimball was also an astute student of the scriptures. Before he made any changes, he asked several apostles to read the scriptures and see if the, there was justification in there for the priesthood policy to continue. President Kimball also had a few special experiences to convince him that it might be time for the priesthood policy to change. For instance, he was visiting a chapel in Brazil and there was a black member of the church there helping construct it. President Kimball walked up to the man and said, how can you help with this when you know you can't receive all the blessings? The man testified to him that he believed he would receive all the blessings even if he had to wait till the millennium. That touched President Kimball's heart and convinced him that maybe it was time for him to seek for the revelation to change. So he begins to pray, and he begins to ask Heavenly Father if it's time for the revelation to change. He even invited all the members of the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve to join him in prayer together on a specific day. During that meeting, there were several special spiritual manifestations. For instance, Legrand Richards, who was the oldest apostle present, said, I saw during the meeting a man seated in a chair above the organ bearded and dressed in white, having the appearance of Wilford Woodruff. I'm not a visionary man. This was not imagination. It might be that I was privileged to see him because I'm the only one here who had seen President Woodruff in person. Elder Richards took his vision of President Woodruff as a sign that it was time for the change to be made. President Woodruff was the prophet that had received Official Declaration 1, and Elder Richards took this to mean that it was time for an Official Declaration number 2, changing the priesthood policy. Now, what was unanimous was that every single person that was there received the revelation altogether. President Gordon B. Hinckley later on said, there was a hallowed and sanctified atmosphere in the room. For me, it felt as if a conduit opened between the heavenly throne and the kneeling, pleading prophet. And by the power of the Holy Ghost, there came to that prophet an assurance that the thing which he had prayed for was right and that the time had come. Everybody that emerged from that meeting knew that it was 
time for the policy to change. And even though there were two apostles that weren't present, Delbert Stapley and Marky Peterson, President Kimball made sure that they were contacted immediately and told of the revelation and given their sustaining vote to it as well. Elder Stapley was in the hospital, and all three members of the First Presidency went to visit him. Elder Peterson was on assignment in South America. President Kimball called him personally, and they both agreed to sustain the revelation. Even some apostles that had ardently defended the priesthood policy agreed with the revelation. For instance, Bruce R. McConkie said, We get our truth and our light, line upon line, and precept upon precept. We've now had added a new flood of intelligence and light on this particular subject, and it erases all the darkness and all the views and all the thoughts of the past. They don't matter anymore. Over 40 years removed from the revelation being given, leaders of the church are still urging us to reach out to people of different races and to help bring an end to racism. You might remember that really recently, President Russell M. Nelson said, I grieve that our black brothers and sisters the world over are enduring the pains of racism and prejudice. Today, I call upon our members everywhere to lead out in abandoning attitudes and actions of prejudice. I plead with you to promote respect for all of God's children. So the prophet's not just urging us to not be racist, he's asking us to lead out in ending racism. Now, one last stop in our scripture journey today, and that's the Articles of Faith. A little bit of background. The Articles of Faith were prepared by Joseph Smith and published first in the church newspaper, The Times and Seasons. Joseph Smith was working off some earlier drafts that people may have written, like Orson Pratt, to summarize the beliefs of the church for an audience of people that weren't members of the church. Originally, this letter was sent to John Wentworth, the publisher of the Chicago Democrat, for a history that one of his friends was writing about the religions in America. We don't have the original letter. And John Wentworth never published the letter that Joseph Smith sent, but Joseph himself decided to publish it in the church newspaper. It contained 13 brief statements that are today known as the Articles of Faith. Later members of the church took these Articles of Faith and put them into the scriptures as a great little summary of what Latter-day Saints believe. Now, not everything the Latter-day Saints believe are contained in the Articles of Faith. For instance, it doesn't necessarily mention the temple or the ordinances of the temple, which are still really important to us. These Articles of Faith are intended primarily for our friends of other faiths to introduce them to who we are and what we believe. So it starts out with the most basic of our beliefs, that we believe in God, the Eternal Father, and in His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. And then it moves into some more peculiar beliefs. For instance, when it comes to the view of the fall, we don't use the word sin or original sin. Instead, Joseph Smith said, we believe that men will be punished for their own sins and not for Adam's transgression. In other words, we don't believe that Adam and Eve's tr sins or transgressions were transferred onto us. We still suffer the effects of the fall, but those effects are overcome through the atonement of Jesus Christ, and we have to reckon with our own sins. Article of Faith number three expresses a really important principle that we believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. The Articles of Faith cover a lot of ground in a short period of time, from the first principles and ordinances of the gospel, to our belief in scripture, to our belief in the return of Jesus Christ to earth in the city of Zion. One of the most important principles taught in the Article of Faith is the idea of continuing revelation. Article of Faith number nine says, we believe all that God has revealed, all that he does now reveal, and we believe that he will yet reveal many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now, that's maybe the most important thing to remember, is that we live in a living church that's led by a living Christ through living revelation. Official Declaration 1, Official Declaration 2, and the Articles of Faith are all a great reminder that the Lord is continuing to direct his church, that he didn't just set things up and then leave us to our own devices, that he's still an active force directing, correcting, and guiding us down the paths that we need to go to. Joseph Smith ended the Articles of Faith by saying, If there is anything virtuous, lovely, or of good report or praiseworthy, we seek after these things. And that's exactly what we should do. We always seek to know the Lord's will, but we also see the good in the world around us and find the ways that we can help add to the good and make the world a better place. Thank you.